Hi everyone, thanks for coming today. Um, as you know, we're um, joined by Nat Broom, um, who will be presenting on volunteer management plan. I'm Mark, for, uh, one of the members, serve, a member of relationship managers at Unisport, um, and Nat is um, national programs manager. So thanks Nat, and I'll, I'll let you take it away and present on volunteer management. Wonderful, thanks very much, Mark. Um, let me just get us in a position where I can share my screen with everybody. Um, if somebody wants to give me the nod as to whether that's working. Yeah, that's all good. And sorry, one other thing is if you have any questions along the way, just put those in the chat and I'll, um, we'll probably address those at the end today and I'll, um, I'll feed those to Nat as we're going through. So any questions, just put those in there and we'll get to those along the way. Awesome. Such a good host there, Mark. <laughs> um, so before we get cracking, just to let you know, I've added a couple of documents in the chat um, of this group. So if you, they're kind of for reference, I'll mention them throughout the presentation um, or just at the beginning of the presentation, but it's also something for you to kind of just take away and have a look at it as a bit of a reference point for the future. Um, so hopefully everybody can see those. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's great to see some familiar faces amongst those of you that are here. Um, also great for me to see some faces I'm not so familiar with. Um, so uh, welcome to the session. For those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Natalie Broom. I'm the um, project manager for the Nationals at Unisport. So I work, um, I manage the team that works across all of the events that we deliver and all of the competitions that we deliver um, throughout the year. So Div 1, Div 2 competitions, um, and obviously also the national championship side of things as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about volunteer management plans or our volunteer management process today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I've worked for Unisport for about four and a half years now um, in various roles. I actually joined the organisation in the capacity of the workforce coordinator in 2016 when um, the old Uni Games was in Perth. Um, and have since obviously stayed with the organisation and, and worked my way up through to now um, being part of the senior management team, which is, which is really nice. Um, but prior to that, my history um, has actually been working in the university sector back in the UK, where I worked at two different universities um, running their sport volunteering programmes. So that's both um, community engagement and also um, student coaching on campus um, programmes as well. So have a little bit of experience in, in the volunteer space. Um, and I've also been quite fortunate in that I've had the opportunity to work on a number of major sporting events as well. So a um, bit of a varied past, um, but I think given my past, that's potentially why the team thought I might be good to have a chat with you guys about volunteer management plans today. So to give you some perspective on what I'm hoping to achieve out of this session, um, it would have been very easy for me to just provide you all with a copy of the volunteer management plan that we use. Um, however, as, as you all know, depending on the, the volunteer program you're running, depending on whether it's an event um, that you're recruiting volunteers for or whether it's a specific program that might last a semester that you're looking to recruit volunteers for, all of them are different and they have very different needs. Um, and I figured we're better off going through the general framework that we use in our volunteer management planning process um, and looking at the key elements of our, our volunteer management plan and how we, uh, sorry, what the major components of each of those elements are and, and giving you some ideas and some thoughts around um, what to consider when creating your own volunteer management plans, but also getting yourselves prepared um, to develop a volunteer program to deliver. So, Hopefully, um, there'll be a few nuggets of wisdom um, within my, my slides today. Uh, there will be some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and as Mark mentioned, if you've got any questions, you want to pop them into the chat, um, we'll be able to go through those at the end. So what is a volunteer management plan? Now, very specifically for us, um, with the nature of our events, um, we have had volunteer management plans that have evolved as our events have evolved. Um, but essentially for Unisport, um, our volunteer management plan is, is the Bible or the guide as to how we're going to run our volunteer programs. Um, so it looks into all of the elements that get put together to ensure that we can recruit, train and 
deliver, a vol- um, sorry, recruit and train the volunteers that we need to support our competitions, um, but also deliver a meaningful volunteer program for those those um, volunteers that are involved with any of the events we deliver. Um, so typically with Nationals Div 1 and Div 2 um, event, we're in a fortunate position where we will actually recruit someone to come on board as a volunteer coordinator to deliver our volunteer management program and, and our volunteer management plan. Um, Whereas that's not necessarily the case um, with our national champs or, or our smaller events. So we use the volunteer management plan as, as that Bible and that guide to make sure that we've considered everything that needs to be thought about when bringing volunteers into our organisation. So as you're all probably very aware, COVID happened, um, which has given us a bit of time to really look back and, and review some of our processes and some of our plans. Um, and the volunteer management plan is actually one that we're looking at at the moment. Um, and we're going through a review, so it's quite quite pertinent that this, uh, this presentation has popped up at this time. Um, so the key things that we found out through our initial review is there's really six key stages to our volunteer management plan and to the development of our volunteer programs. So that's the program administration, the preparation phase, promotion and engagement, recruitment, management and deployment, and then obviously the evaluation stage at the end. So I'm going to go through each of these stages and just highlight with you a number of key elements um, and things that you can think through when it comes to um, preparing a, a management plan for yourselves. So program administration from a uni sport perspective, this um, is, is typically the, the very non-sexy side of, of any management plans or any operational plans that we put in place. Um, and it's for us, it's the pre-planning stage. Um, so this is thinking about all of our major elements that really underpin ensuring that the um, volunteer program that we deliver is safe, it's effective, and it, it covers relevant policy or, or procedure that needs to be in place. Now, for us, this will initially be delivered by myself prior to the recruitment of the volunteer coordinator, or in the likes of the national championships events, um, the sport and operations manager will go through these processes um, that are all relevant to the event that they're um, working through or that they're developing the volunteer program for. So the key things that we look at in this, this um, program admin or, you know, your key um, pre-planning stage, staffing process, who is it that's going to run or look after all of the requirements of the volunteer plan? Um, who's going to be that key point of delivery? Um, and do we actually need to recruit someone into that role? Do we have capacity for that? Or is that something we're going to allocate to staff that are um, internal to the organisation? Review of our policy. So again, fortunately, we go through a process annually where we do a, a full review of all of our policy and procedure organisation wide and event wise. Um, and with the evolution of our competitions, naturally through that review process, um, volunteers are, are kept in mind um, with the content of those policies just to ensure that where it is relevant, um, volunteers um, volunteer requirements are outlined in those policies um, and how those policies apply to volunteers are also identified. So as an example I've just I've just mentioned here is our media policy. So that will mention that um, whilst at an event um, volunteers if if approached by media uh, this is how they are to deal with that situation. This is what they have um, the ability to to do and this is how how they should respond to that um, and then it outlines how the media policy then applies further to those volunteers um, so we go through a process making sure all of our policies um, truly reflect how the the whole workforce as well as the volunteers are impacted by that policy the most sexy part of any event um, and obviously the volunteer management plan uh, is the risk management process. Um, now, as you'll probably all know, these can be pretty hefty documents, um, but with the national side of things, <coughs> excuse me, we have quite an extensive risk management plan and within that risk management plan, um, we will ex um, specifically identify risks that may be caused or may be pertinent to volunteers or risks that may arise. So one of the um, documents I've shared with you there is just an example of a, some of our risk management um, plan risk tables um, where we identify um, any elements that could potentially happen at an event and what we do, what um, we put in place to mitigate those risks potentially happening. 
So you'll see through this um, these tables here. Again, there's a few number of things explicitly um, identified for volunteers, um, but then also within um, our wider risk tables, there may be a number of things that aren't necessarily specifically identified for volunteers, but are in other functional areas of the event that could have an impact on volunteers. So for example, down here, um, again, kind of linking back to the media side of things, um, training of staff and volunteers to outline media policy. So we're identifying within our, our risk management, um, our risk tables, um, that training needs to be given to the volunteers, um, which then in a circumstance of any media inquiries, um, we've delivered that training, we've identified that the volunteers will be trained appropriately, um, therefore helping to mitigate any risk that may happen from potential negative comments or, or something that comes out that way. Also part of an important, um, uh, an, sorry, an important part of the uh, risk management planning process is um, any strategies or ways to mitigate um, personnel shortage. Well, I mean, for us, this is an, an abstract in our risk management plan um, that identifies what we're going to do in a situation where half of our volunteers turn up. This is how we're going to manage this process. Um, this is what we're going to do. And this is who needs to be notified of, um, of what needs to happen. So this all forms part of that risk management side of things. So moving on to insurance, again, um, we need to make sure that we've got the relevant insurance in place, um, as you would for public liability. We also need to make sure we have voluntary workers insurance to cover not only the number of volunteers um, that are going to be involved in our programmes, um, but also that we're adequately covered um, to be protected from liability. Now, I know there was a question asked previously around vicarious liability of volunteers at events. Um, so just to touch on that on that very, very quickly, um, this will be different in each state, but specifically for Queensland and New South Wales, um, any not for profit organisation is actually protected um, from uh, any vicarious liability and um, the organisations have provided the same protection as what the individual volunteers would. So there's legislation in place to protect us as a not-for-profit against that. Um, however, in the instance of any gross negligence, um, the organisation themselves could still be seen to be liable. So just ensuring that your, your, volunt your voluntary workers insurance has a strong level of um, cover from liability is really important um, and then also ensuring that in that risk management plan um, and in your risk management process that we're identifying everything that we can that can potentially mitigate any risk or behaviours that may cause harm or that a volunteer could elicit that may cause um, harm or damage. Next, oh Sorry, I've got a super sensitive mouse. Um, next thing we move on to is uh, budget allocation. Obviously, it's difficult to deliver a volunteer program if you haven't got some um, some funds to support it. And volunteers love nothing more than getting a free T-shirt and some goodies to help them. Um, so we look through the, the budgeting process for our events. Um, and then the next step for us is our operations plan. So the risk management plan, uh, sorry, the risk management, the volunteer management plan is that underpinning document, like the meat and the bones behind, this is how we're going to deliver our volunteer program. And then what we will work through is actually a, a specific volunteer um, operations plan for the volunteer program. So I'm not sure if any of you use specific um, project management tools um, to, um, to kind of track and uh, keep track of how you manage any projects on campus, but we've recently started using, um, and typically I can't get it to do what I need it to do. We've started using uh, monday.com this year to set our operational plans, um, which help our staff to keep track of exactly, you know, what tasks need to be done, key dates and so forth. So as you can just see here as a quick example, um, this, the operation plan forms the detail of what comes out of the volunteer management plan. So once we've got the volunteer coordinator in place, we'll go through this process with them of setting our timelines, setting our deadlines um, and 
adding in any key elements into this operations plan um, to make sure that we can keep track of how the program is developing as, as we go through the planning and delivery phase. So once we've done our pre-planning phase, we move into preparation. Now this for us essentially is all of your, your major um, administrative tasks that need to happen to ensure that your volunteer program will run successfully and that you, you're prepared to roll out. You know, you've, you know when your key dates are, you know what your timelines are, um, and it sets yourself as an organization right off on the right foot to say, yep, we're, we're ready to go ahead. Um, and we can we can roll out this this volunteer program. So the way we work through this, um, and one of the key elements for me, kind of actually gives you a bit of an insight into how my brain works, which is kind of slightly backwards compared to the average person. Um, but timelines are really important for us, and especially when it comes to the nationals, where we're looking to recruit anywhere between 150 to 200 volunteers. Um, we need to make sure that we're giving ourselves enough time to manage that whole process. So once we've got the volunteer coordinator recruited, what we look to do is set our, our what we call our good to go date. And this is the date at which we want to have all of our volunteers good to go, you know, they can, they're trained, they're recruited, they're trained, we know they're confident with their roles, um, they can roll out straight away and they can go and hit the ground running when it comes to being at the event. Now, with any volunteer, well, any events and specifically with volunteers, stuff happens, people don't get back to you, people miss training sessions and then you'll hear from them three days later and they still really, really, really want to be involved. So we tend to set our good to go date probably about a week out or a week and a half out from the event. Um, and this is the date where we go, yeah, this is when we want to have all of our volunteers ready and good to go. So part of the preparation phase is we create relevant major timelines to get us to that good to go date. So the three key elements of that, those timelines are your promotion timelines. So when are we going to promote the program? How are we going to promote the program? And you know, when does it start and end of our promotion phase? recruitment when do we start recruiting um when does registrations open when does registrations close um and then the training phase so obviously how are we going to do the training when is when are the volunteers going to be trained by and what happens through that process so we'll sit down we'll create those major timelines to give us a skeleton that allows us to um work towards achieving our good to go date but also keeping track of our key milestones. So once you've created those timelines, you'll essentially end up with a list of key milestones that might be regos open, regos close, training um, starts, training finishes, and that forms the, um, the bones of your planning process from there on in. So we're quite fortunate in that our events are very similar every year. Um, and we can generally get a good feel that, you know, we know we're going to have similar roles every year. The responsibilities may change slightly, but essentially um, we can tweak and we can update our role descriptions. However, from the perspective of, a, of yourselves that might be starting a new program or might be um, just you, you've got a very small one off event, you might not know what you need volunteers for. So when you go back into the administration and, and um, the preparation process, think about what can be, what is it you need volunteers to, to support you with? It, are there specific areas of the event, specific functional areas? You know, we would divide them up into sport, um, administration, operations. You know, are there specific functional departments that you need to recruit volunteers for? Um, and what do you want them to do? Let me move on to making sure we've got all of the documents prepared. So position descriptions are created, volunteer handbooks are created, um, any volunteer briefing documents, uh, anything we need to let them know about the event is prepared and ready so that when you start rolling out your programme, um, you can send that out to the relevant volunteers um, or your recruited volunteers. Um, the registration process or expression of interest process, um, 
we tend to roll with a direct registration process, um, which is online, which allows people to sign up at any point throughout the year. Uh, and then we'll just maintain contact with them throughout the year to keep them updated on any opportunities that are coming up. Um, but this is the stage where you would go, right, this is how we're going to run our registrations. Um, they're either going to be done online or if it's a small event on campus, is it something that can be done face to face by people just dropping in and, and having a chat with you and giving you some various information there? We'll work through all of our database creation, um, ensuring that our templates are, are all set up and, and good to go. Um, and then this is the phase where you start thinking about, okay, what, what, what the free t-shirts we're giving our volunteers gonna look like? Where are we gonna get them from? Um, and how are we gonna spend our money? How are we gonna actually allocate that money um, that we have set aside for the program to ensure we're getting the best um, out of the program? So then we move into the third, 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 third third phase, um, which is promotion and engagement. So one of the key um, considerations for us is who, who is our target audience? Who are we trying to promote our volunteer program to? Um, and how do we want to engage with them? So we have specifically found over the last um, two years, three years that our event's been on the Gold Coast, we have seen a rapid change in the engagement or the, this type of volunteer that engage with our events. Historically, it used to be a lot of university students that weren't competing, might have had something to do with access to the social programme with their accreditation, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm just uh, spitballing that one. Um, but since we've been on the coast for the last four years, we've seen a real increase with local community members. So we have adapted and changed our promotion and our engagement platforms to, to suit that because we're managing to retain a large number of local volunteers who know our competitions, who know our venues, and um, we just want to continue being involved and see our event grow, which is fantastic. So key things to think about and in the promotion engagement phase is who your target audience is, and then what are the best ways to engage with them? So informal, informal engagement. Uh, we have had historically a lot of success at O days and market days on campus promoting um, the volunteer program and volunteer opportunities to students. However, what you can find is that it's a lot of staff time um, going out to, to those O days or those market days but then potentially you're not getting as much return as what you could do through using social media platforms or having um, sign, up, um, sign up messages online. So think about what mediums you want to use um, that are best to engage with that target audience. Um, and then the production of a marketing and communications plan for your volunteer program. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, your marketing and comms plan needs to be war and peace. We certainly don't have a 22 page marketing and comms plan just for the volunteering side of our events. Um, but knowing your audience and how they want to be, how they like to be communicated is highly valuable for us. So as I've kind of mentioned, we've had a high increase in community members. So old mate Jeff, who's worked at the local rugby club or volunteered at the local rugby club for 22 years, um, knows the whole place can walk around it with his eyes shut backwards and not bump into a single thing. Um, he can be incredibly valuable to what we are trying to achieve as our events um, because he's just internally passionate. Um, and what we have found is those golden oldies, they certainly love an advert in the paper and they're still the kind of people that will go to a notice board in a community centre um, and get 90% of their information from. And likewise, do they love a phone call? Um, if you end up getting stuck on the phone to old mate Jeff, um, you can be sat there. I know our old volunteer coordinator had one volunteer who certainly liked to call for a chat now and then. Um, but so we, again, have, have tweaked our, the way that we promote things to um, engage with that golden oldie community a little bit better than what we have done historically. Um, whereas on the flip side, students are very happy to just receive a message from Facebook to say this is an opportunity, come and get involved. Um, so just a few key things to think about when you're looking at um, promoting um, and promoting your, your volunteer program and engaging with the target audience. Um, and then 
Then within this stage, making sure that you're preparing all of your promotional materials. So your marketing collateral is ready. Um, your website is updated, good to go. Your role descriptions are on there. So as soon as you hit the trigger on opening registrations and trying to recruit volunteers, all of the information that they need is easily accessible. So then we move into the recruitment phase. Now, again, with my slightly different uh, thinking process, um, this is where we, we constantly keep in mind our, our good to go date. Um, so there are some major elements to the recruitment phase. Obviously, your first one is the registration process. Now, getting the registration process right is really crucial. Historically, and I will hold my hands up to this potentially being influenced by my first role with the organisation, our volunteer registration was quite lengthy. Um, we, I think it actually probably took around 15 minutes to complete, um, which is too long. And what we have noticed over the last couple of years is that we get high dropout rates halfway through completion of the registration process, or we had been getting high dropout rates um, because we're asking we're asking for too much. Um, so a streamlined registration process is really important. Um, but on the flip side, it is vital to catch as much relevant information as you can. So if you're recruiting large volumes of volunteers, um, when you get to the selection process, it might be quite difficult to get through the whole cohort of uh, volunteers or um, registrations or expressions of interest that you've had. So for us, we need to find a way to be able to sift through volunteers and potentially uh, identify people for a, a quick role allocation based on the information they've provided us. So I would 100% suggest that in any registration processes, we, we ask for availability over the time of the, um, the event or the program um, that's being rolled out. Um, preference of roles. So we should have all of the roles, role descriptions accessible on the website. So they've got an opportunity to say, actually, I would really like to do that role. Um, and previous experience. So they can say, I'd like to do that role. And I have experience doing that here. So if we get to the point where we need to explicitly use the application to select the volunteers for that program, we've got more information in there that we can use to make us feel relatively comfortable um, that we've matched that student or that, sorry, that volunteer with a role that's appropriate for them. So registration process is key. Um, think about the requirements of the roles. So we have a structure within our um, event where we have a, a sports volunteer and a sport team leader. Now, the sport team leader is a slightly more senior role. They have a bit more um, that's required of them at, at the event in terms of they may manage a group of volunteers. Um, they may help manage the um, results process for the competition managers. So they have a bit more responsibility. Um, so when we're moving into the selection phase, do we then need to start thinking about what the roles are required and how in depth that selection process needs to needs to be? Now, we like to observe in our selection process, we like to observe leadership qualities for these sport team leader roles, because we know sometimes they might actually be managing a team of 10 to 15 volunteers every single day. Um, and we need to select some volunteers that are you know, that are appropriate to do that and, and have those leadership skills. So that then all plays into how we decide to select our volunteers and the selection process. So there's a number of options, a number of ways you can do it. Applications, uh, reviews of the application process. Have you got enough information through the application process to do selection? If you're running a one day event and you need two volunteers to stand on a gate and click in and click out numbers of attendance at that event, is that something that you could that you could select someone probably directly from registration? Yes, I would suggest it is. And then as long as you're going through a process of maybe having a face to face or having some engagement before you formally um, offer them the role. Um, but you can get enough information from the registration process to allow you to do that. However, as I mentioned with the sport team leaders, are you going to get enough information just from a, a registration or an application 
to identify whether they would be a good team leader in a potential pressure situation? Potentially not. So there's options to do application review, face-to-face -face recruitment sessions, group sessions, one-to-one -one interviews. Um, and also there's a fallback that we occasionally lean to, which is the old tele telephone screening option. However, in this day and age, nobody seems to have time um, to phone up 150 volunteers for a chat that may last at least half an hour. So may not be an appropriate medium to use. Um, however, as I've mentioned, with large volume and with volunteers that potentially might not be able to attend your selection sessions, there needs to be some form of processes that you can fall back on to help you in this recruitment phase. So typically what we do, what we do to select our volunteers and especially our team leaders um, is we will run a, a group selection day that has a number of activities throughout it. Um, it might be that there's a, a group task. In fact, one of the tasks we have used is split the volunteers into groups. We've given them a task to build something. They've got half an hour or 20 minutes to build a tower that supports the weight of a uh, a football or a basketball we've given them the um the tools to do so and then we've just assessed them on that day as to how they interact with other people and taken notes um, and we also did a bit of a speed dating uh question question answer um process with a number of the volunteers as well just to get to know them a little bit more and figure out which roles they might fit um fit well into so one of the other um documents i've provided you with there it's actually our recruitment flowchart. I'm not going to go through this um, with you in detail, but as you can see, it is quite lengthy. And it talks about some of the stages of our volunteer management process. So the planning phase, what we need to do to kind of get that everything up and ready before we start the recruitment. Um, and then what happens in the selection, um, role allocation and, and de deployment phases. Uh, back to the presentation. Okay, so moving through into management and deployment. Um, now, this is probably the largest section of our volunteer management plan, um, and essentially, it, it covers all of the major elements. You've, you know, you've figured out how you're going to market your program. You've, you've thought about what roles you need, what volunteers you need it for. You've gone through the recruitment process um, and then we need to look at how we're going to allocate those um, volunteers to roles that are appropriate for them, how we're going to train them um, and what's going to happen at event time or when they're within part of that, uh, the event mode or part of the program. So the major elements of the, the management and de deployment, deployment phase, two seconds, apologies. Um, so role allocation and rostering. So we capture information, as I mentioned in our registration process, about um, availability and about roles that they're interested in. And so we've gone through the recruitment process. We've invited the students to their selection events. We've gained a little bit more information, students, volunteers. Um, we've gained a bit more information about them and we're starting to figure out yeah, these, these, this bunch of volunteers are going to be great for the sport team. This bunch can be great for the ops team. Um, so we're getting to this where we're um, allocating roles to the volunteers um, and we're starting to actually build that picture of what the volunteer team is going to look like. Now, I've put this picture specifically on this, um, this uh, slide because Renato here um, was an absolute legend uh, and you know sometimes and I'm sure you've all seen this you will get absolute gold volunteers um, who will just move mountains for you um, and what we've certainly found is if there is a volunteer who in any of the selection processes shows a specific interest or a passion in a certain area if you get that student in the role that they want they will literally move mountains for you so renato came through um, our general recruitment process we realized very very quickly at the selection day that he had an interest in surfing he was super passionate very bubbly so we um, paired him up with obviously the surfing competition and he was in his element he was fantastic and he literally was there from the crack of dawn till you know 
at the end of the day, doing everything he possibly could to support the event. And subsequently, he now actually works for Surfing New South Wales, which is brilliant. Um, so, you know, I've just put their square peg in a round hole. We don't want to be forcing volunteers into roles that we know aren't appropriate for them. But then if you can get that square peg in a square hole, they're going to be fantastic to help support the event that you're delivering. So back to role allocation and rostering. This process will take a considerable amount of time, um, mainly because a lot of your time is spent sending your role allocations to your volunteers, um, giving them their rosters, them coming back to you, then saying, oh, I can't do this, can't do that time now, blah, 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 um, which can get a little bit tedious and difficult to manage. Now, there are softwares available that can help to manage that process. Um, we don't use one at the minute, but it's something that we're looking, looking to do. So we do a lot of this manually. So to help us in this process, one of the things we implement is um, specific requirements around volunteering. So we say that we need a minimum commitment of three shifts throughout the duration of the competition. Um, each of those shifts are, are a minimum of five to six hours. And if possible, then we ask that um, volunteers are able to do those three shifts on three, um, three, like three days together. If that makes sense, um, because it helps in the grander scheme of things to fill gaps of when, you know, one volunteer is only available for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we need to fill a hole for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and so forth. Um, so we give ourselves some parameters that we make that quite clear in the recruitment process that you know, the, this is what you need to be able to commit to to be part of the programme. Um, set clear outlines with the um, rostering expectations. So again, when we're communicating with our volunteers, we let them know that there will be one opportunity to amend their roster. We will build their rosters based on the um, availability they have given us. Um, and we'll let them know at the training session or the, sorry, the selection event, this is, you will have one opportunity to amend your rosters once you've received them. Um, and then beyond that, you know, we do kind of help them out a little bit if we can, but you know, beyond that, we try not to we try not to change things too much because it gets to the point where you're responding to 50, 60 emails a week, um, and there's only so much chess you can play before you you go a bit too cross-eyed. So we just manage those expectations in that place. Um, and then a key point I've just put there: if you don't hear back from volunteers after three times, cut them loose. Um, Three times actually may, may be a fair bit too much, um, but you will always find undoubtedly that there will be someone that has conveniently missed all two of your first emails or both of your first emails and then gives you a call last minute to say, oh, I'm really sorry, I completely forgot, I still want to do stuff. Um, and of course, where possible, you know, we don't want to turn away people that are, um, that want to help and want to be involved, um, but they get to a point where you need to cut people loose um, otherwise you just end up spending your whole time chasing them which is not productive for anybody so then moving into the training phase um, there's again depending on the size of the event or or the the way that the program uh, either the event or the program that you're recruiting volunteers uh, is taking place um, it's important to make sure that your volunteers are trained adequately for the roles that they're doing. So that includes ensuring that they are comfortable with their rights as a volunteer and what they have rights to um, and ensure that they understand their rights. You know, they have rights to be provided with a volunteer uniform, to be provided with meals on shift. Um, they have rights to appropriate training, to, um, to be able to question and understand policy that's relevant to them and so forth. Um, and then delving into the actual training that your volunteers receive. For us, it's really important that the volunteers understand who Unisport are, um, what it is that we're trying to achieve with our events, what our major um, objectives of the events are, and what our events are about. You know, we've been through quite a transition in that our events are... Um, we're looking to achieve a high standard of competition and a competitive environment that is still fun, that embraces friendship, um, that embraces having fun and, and trying your best and competing in a 
in a happy engaging sporting environment but still you know we still want to engage that into university rivalry but we want to create an experience that our students are going to go away from and go that was brilliant we're coming back next year and we're going to we're going to win we're going to beat UTS we're going to beat Sydney and the volunteers are integral to building that atmosphere so we make sure that that is a real solid part of the the training process for us Another thing that is really important is um, training around risk management, around risk mitigation, um, identifying any potential risks um, or uh, incident management processes, because the volunteers are your people on the ground. There's a lot more volunteers, you know, 200 of them is a lot more than one of me. So I can't see everything that's happening. So ensuring that they are trained appropriately to be able to either feed information in if they see something that might be a risk and feed that into their supervisors or put them in a position where it's something, if it's something that they can deal with, they feel comfortable to do that. Um, we make sure that's part of the training process. And then we get into the nitty gritty of the actual roles. Um, so ensuring that the volunteers, if they're working with the competition managers to uh, do the results inputting process, they've received that training. Uh, if there are specific requirements on a on a venue that they need to be aware about aware of, we try and make sure we have the opportunity for them to do their venue specific training on the morning of their first shift, um, as opposed to just getting to the venue, um, starting straight away and not knowing where anything is. So we allocate some time within their first shift to allow them that opportunity to do it. Um, so all of the training process is very dependent on what the roles of the volunteers are and the responsibilities that they're going to have um, at that event or on that program. So then moving into the event time management side of things, um, our volunteer management plan will obviously identifies the people that engage with volunteers throughout the event and throughout competition time. So for us, it's not necessarily going to be myself or the volunteer coordinator that is the supervisor for those volunteers day on day. It's going to be the competition management team or it's going to be the um, event coordinators or the sports coordinators that are at the venues that they're at. So ensuring that there is an appropriate briefing of the volunteer supervisors is really, really important. Make sure the supervisors are provided with the relevant contact details and information for those volunteers who are allocated to them and given the, the rosters um, so that they know who's going to be, where they're going to be when they need them and, and who's on their shifts um, is vitally important. And also, as I mentioned about through the training process, being able to instill the understanding of what we're trying to achieve at the event, we want the supervisors to be able to echo that briefing with their volunteers as well. So ensure that the supervisors understand what the um, the outcomes we're trying to achieve with the event are um, and that they're able to be that voice of support for, for you as an organisation as well. Um, some kind of smaller event time considerations. Um, obviously, uniform allocation is is really important. Um, volunteers are always super excited to know when they're going to get their uniform, when they can wear it, um, where they can't wear it, uh, what they're going to get in terms of merchandise. And naturally, if you have a budget to spend, um, you know, it, it's certainly going to go a long way to helping retain your volunteers and um, you know, keep them keep them feeling quite happy and proud that they can be seen as being part of the event or the program as well. Um, just consider how your volunteers are going to be looked after at the event in terms of catering processes. You know, are there at a venue where catering can happen on site? Do you need to ensure that they're getting packed lunches sent out to them, um, or is does that process need to be managed in any specific way? Um, and then, vitally important that you. Well, for us, um, it's part of our risk management process, but important that we attract uh, we track attendance of volunteers at our event our, our events and our venues, so that we know um, a whether people are turning up or not, which is always helpful. B whether we're in a situation where we've got a personnel shortage, as I identified back at the start of the, the presentation. You know what needs to happen if we're really relying on having five volunteers at the swimming pool and we only get two there on a morning is there a way that we can adapt that um, and what are the contingencies to to help manage that 
Um, and also it's a great way to be able to when you're giving back to the volunteers and you're if you create them um, statements of service or you provide them with certificate certification one thing that we do do is track the number of hours that the volunteers um, do with us at the event so that we can put that in their statement of service and thank them for their 72 hours over a week of competition um, for their engagement also, very briefly, in terms of a, a risk management point, if there happens to be a fire evacuation or something like that on site um, during the middle of an event, we will request that our competition managers take their um, their sign in, sign out attendance tracking sheets with them just so that they can double check that everybody's got out the venue um, when they needed to and so forth. And then the last part of the for us, the management and deployment phase is is recognition. Um, and this stems all the way throughout the delivery of the programs um, and post event delivery, um, sorry, post event at the end of the event. Typically, we will run a thank you function for our volunteers. We'll put on a nice spread. Um, we collect a lot of photos and everything with the volunteers throughout the week and just give them a bit of a you know, a slideshow of thank you for all of your hard work. We've had some great fun together. Um, and, you know, we, we really appreciate the time and energy that you put into volunteering with us because, I mean, essentially, we would very much struggle to run our events without any volunteers. Um, it could happen. There would be long queues for check-ins and um, things might not be as, as smooth as they could be. But essentially the perfect event falls on the shoulders of the volunteer workforce that are, that are supporting you um so we want to make sure that we recognize the, the time and effort and energy that they put in for us so we'll make sure that we run a, a good function for them to say thanks for all their help and support and then the final part of our um, volunteer management plan uh, is the evaluation process um, and this, again, fortunately, I've inherited years of feedback that we've received from the events and from the processes that we run. Um, but for us, especially with the way our events have changed over the last three years um, and with the way that social media has changed lives so much, um, the evaluation process is, is really vital for us because I'll tell you one thing, volunteers aren't scared to give you their opinion um whether you want to hear it or not uh, happy to give you that feedback um but it's great to understand things from their perspective you know how was the recruitment process is there anything we could have done better how was your time on venue um but likewise that perspective of both the staff or your staff that are working on that project the competition management teams or the the um, external staff that are involved in that program um, is really important to understand whether you're hitting the mark with what your volunteers roles are and what they're doing um, or whether things need to be changed up next time you come around to delivering um, we would typically run both focus groups post event um, and surveys uh, out to all of our volunteers um, just to get some some feedback from them um, and then when we do our event review process we go through the process of collating all of those recommendations um, and then feeding them back into phase one um, of the volunteer management plan, which is essentially getting yourself in a position where you've updated that management plan. Um, any amendments need to be made and noted and you can roll that into the next um, the next time you deliver that that volunteer management plan. So hopefully. Um, Hopefully I've been able to give you kind of a snapshot of the, the key elements to think about in those six phases of, of our volunteer management plan. I did promise some nuggets of wisdom um, and it wouldn't be me if I didn't throw some form of corny joke into the mix there. So I hope that's appreciated by some people. Um, so some things, just a few things I have learned um, over the years working with volunteers. Um, Volunteer attrition, it's really interesting. So with mass volunteer recruitment, we do see anywhere between a 40 to 50 40 to percent drop off in terms of number of volunteers or number of people that register with us to volunteer for a specific event to the actual number of volunteers that we get committing at event time. Um, now, that is not 
atypical. It's it's it is quite a typical figure within the volunteer world I have experienced. Um, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it's not very productive um, when you need 150 volunteers to know that your well-oiled vent machine will work perfectly. Um, and you're down to 100 volunteers, which will still work, um, but just makes things a little bit more stressful. Um, so some things to think about is when you think you've got the number of volunteers you need for specific roles or for a specific area, add on at least 20% to that, um, that you try and recruit. And hopefully that will help to combat any attrition you see in terms of reg uh, volunteers from registration to actual um, on the ground feet at the event. Um, and that will help you to, to um, mitigate that drop, drop off of volunteers. Um, timelines, really that, that good to go date is uh, a really important, really important date for us. Um, and timelines, I'm a super visual learner. So for me, being able to see a timeline of this is when stuff needs to be done. That is when recruitment needs to finish. This is when promotion needs to start. It's just a great way to help keep, um, well, yes, myself and the team that are working on that project or that plan um, engaged in a way that they can go, oh, it's July. OK, we should have started doing this by now. Yep, that's going and it's going great. Um, and then the final thing uh, is that volunteers definitely are not scared to tell you if they're bored. Um, our events, there is some downtime. You know, we're going to have real busy periods on a morning when everybody's coming in and they're getting their accreditations checked and they're you know, checking in for the day. And then there'll be a couple of hours lull while the first round of games starts. Um, and then you'll get another rush around lunchtime. And volunteers aren't scared to tell you that they're bored, um, which is interesting because when I was young and a volunteer, I probably would have been scared to say that. Um, but what we have done to try and mitigate this is allow some flexibility in their role descriptions. So we would say, you know, typically a sport volunteer's um, role will focus around accreditation checking, supporting with results, blah, you know, X, Y, and Z. However, in the instance of downtime or periods of downtime, we may need you to help with operations. We may need you to help with venue set up in, in, on different fields of play and so forth. So by allowing a bit of flexibility means that if you know it's a quiet time, the volunteers are going to get a little bit antsy because they're not doing much. You can certainly get them involved in helping out in other, other areas of the event um, to, I guess, keep them occupied if you need to. But also at the same time, we're not afraid to say, yep, we understand there's going to be quiet times. If you want to check in with your team leader or check in with your comp manager and you want to go and have 20 minutes and watch a basketball game, as long as your you know, main responsibilities are covered by a volunteer, we're happy for you to do so. Because that's all part of their experience of being involved in the event as well. So that is, that is me. Awesome. Thanks for that, Matt. That was fantastic. Now, do we have any questions? Um, can we please get a copy of this presentation? Yes, it has been recorded and um, I'll upload those um, bits of information that Matt's put in the chat as well. So please feel free to grab that out of the chat today, um, but those will be uploaded as well. Any other questions from anyone? I think I saw one from Deanna, but went to a different screen. Um, just about volunteer training. Did Nat answer your question there, Deanna, throughout the presentation? No, probably nothing. Yes, that's fine. Awesome. Okay, no other questions at all from anyone? Awesome. Thanks again, Nat, and thanks for everyone for turning up, and we'll get that up on the website very soon. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Cool.